Hi everybody, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AnnerieTutors.com and welcome to this video on nucleophilic addition reactions. So in this video we're basically going to show you some of them really important mechanisms that you need to know. Uh, we're going to go through in a generic example first um, and then we're going to show you this one where you make these um, really kind of uh, funny molecules called hydroxy nitriles um, and for some examples you need to know how you make these as well. So uh, very very important. Okay so this, um, this area of chemistry is mainly concerned with the um, carbonyl group. Now the carbonyl group is basically carbon with a double bond and an oxygen attached to it. Um, and I suppose the key feature of the carbonyl group is they have a delta positive and delta negative oxygen. Now this is really, really important because actually all the reactions that you're going to see here are going to be geared around this little feature that it's got here. So the types of mechanisms that, or reactions should we say, that um, these uh, can undergo, or the type of mechanism, yes, is the nucleophilic addition reaction. So that means we need a nucleophile and we're going to add something onto it and we're going to make new products from it. So we need to know what a nucleophile is first. So nucleophiles are attacking molecules and what they have is they have a lone pair of electrons. So things like cyanide, for example, Cn minus, the lone pair sits in the carbon, um, ammonia, NH3, and um, OH minus, hydroxyl groups. So uh, OH minus, again, the lone pair sits on the oxygen. Now the lone pair has got to be readily available. So this lone pair has got to be able to be donated to an area which is um, electron deficient. So something that's delta positive, like carbon, or even fully positive charge, like carbocations, for example. So um, nucleophiles are, are, can be um, pretty reactive substances, and these allow you to produce new products. So let me just show you how this works in terms of a generic thing. So you can see here that we've got our um, carbonyl group. Um, this is just a terminal group. So in other words, we've got a, a, a double bond on the end of a carbon, and that's a terminal carbon, so this makes it an aldehyde. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to add one of these reagents on here. So I'm just going to use the um, generic term, or generic symbol, should I say. Uh, I'm going to put NU for nucleophile. Okay. And we're going to stick the uh, lone pairs on it. So put the lone pairs just there. So all nucleophiles have a lone pair of electrons. They don't always have to have a negative charge. That's a bit of a misconception. Some people think that you must have a negative charge for it to be a nucleophile. That's wrong. The deciding factor is it must have a lone pair of electrons. That's really, really important. Uh, so this nucleophile, I'm just going to put NU. No charge on it. Doesn't really matter. Um, it's good practice to write your um, polarity on your molecule. Your, del your carbon is delta positive and your oxygen is delta negative. Um, this is because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so it pulls them electrons towards itself in this covalent bond. Remember that definition, so it's really, really important. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, draw the mechanism. I'm going to draw the um, arrows in blue to make it really clear. So you can see here, there's your lone pair. This will always attack a delta positive carbon. Remember in mechanisms, the curly arrows always go from an area of high electron density, so where the electrons are coming from, and where they're going to. So this is coming from here to the carbon. Um, you've got to make sure that you draw these precisely and correctly. You can't just put um, an arrow starting anywhere. It must start from the low pair and it must go to the carbon. Nowhere else. It mustn't be kind of like loose and waving all over the place. It must be really specific to that carbon. Otherwise, you'll lose marks. So it's really, really important to get that right. And then what happens is because this is effectively forming a bond with the carbon, that's what the that arrow is representing, you now have oxygen with, um, well, you now have carbon with too many bonds. So um, it obviously has this bond starting to form here. That's one, two, three, four, five. That's too many bonds. So one of the bonds has got to be broken and it's the double bond that breaks to allow carbon to have four bonds, um, which um, is what it prefers to effectively bond with. So um, we're gonna draw a curly arrow. And again, the electrons come from the double bond and they jump onto the oxygen. And what we're going to form is an intermediate. So let me just show you what that intermediate is. So you can see carbon and we have our R group, which is over there. We have a hydrogen, which is there. None of this has changed. This time though, what we've now added is to this carbon, we've added the nucleophile. So we're just going to put NU on there. Um, and we also have an oxygen, there's our oxygen, and we have a negative charge on that oxygen now. The reason why we've got that negative charge is because the electrons have just moved from here 
onto the oxygen, which has now given it a negative charge. Now, obviously, this isn't very stable, so we need to react it with something else. And actually, all of these, um, for example, the nucleophile, will be dissolved in solution. So we'll just put AQ there. And as part of that, you have a source of H plus ions. Um, sometimes your nucleophile might be dissolved in um, acid, for example, and acids would obviously provide, provide lots of H pluses. So we have a H plus, so we have a solution with H plus ions in there already. So there's our H plus, and this comes from the solution that the nucleophile is dissolved in. Um, and then um, what we have to do is then just effectively show this reaction happening. Again, on this oxygen, you will have a lone pair of electrons. Um, so there's an example there. Uh, and one of the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen will then uh, move on to the, um, uh, onto the H plus, uh, and so therefore they will effectively join together. And you don't need to draw the mechanism really for that bit, but what you do need to show is the final product. So the final product is C R H O H nucleophile. So what you've done is you've used a nucleophile and you've added it onto the molecule. Look, there it is. We haven't substituted anything. We haven't swapped one thing for another. It's a straightforward addition reaction. So that's really, really, really important. Okay. Um, okay, now depending on the nucleophile, it obviously depend on the products that you form. We've got three different nucleophiles here that we've got on the board. Um, CN would form um, nitriles, which we will look at in a minute as a specific example. Um, ammonia, <coughs> ammonia will actually form something called um, amines. So depending on what you've got there, it will form an amine there. Uh, and obviously OHs will form alcohols and you'll actually form a diol because you've got an OH there and an OH there. And in fact, you've got a diol molecule. So yeah, they're the type of things that you form. Right, onto the final bit. This is just going to show you a very specific example. So this is looking at um, the manufacturing of something called hydroxynitriles. So we're going to use a very specific um, nucleophile and this is cyanide, okay, which is CN minus. So we're going to draw um, an example. So let's say if we do something like, uh, I don't know, let's say we take ethanol, for example. Okay, let's put hydrogen there. Hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. There we go, right, so here's our ethanol. It's an aldehyde, ethanol, there you go. Um, let's put our delta positives and delta negatives on. Delta positive on the carbon, delta negative on the oxygen. Uh, we're going to get our nucleophile, and our nucleophile this time we're going to use is cyanide, so CN minus. So I'm just going to draw that there. Put your little pair of electrons on. So they sit on the carbon in this case. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add this to the molecule using the mechanism that we've seen up here. Okay, so uh, let's go for it. So we're going to go for uh, lone pair of electrons. Remember that goes to the delta positive carbon. Be specific with what it is. It must be this delta positive carbon. Then we're going to break this double bond here and push the electrons onto the oxygen and we're going to have this intermediate here. So let's draw this out. So we're going to have obviously the CH3 bit at the end is unchanged. So that's nice, nice and easy. Um, and then what we're going to have is you're going to have your oxygen. I'll put the O minus here to keep it kind of the same. It doesn't really matter where it is on that position. And um, we have our CN here. That's our CN. Again, it doesn't really matter if it's there, there, there. It doesn't make any difference. I know it might look a little bit different to that. Uh, and then obviously what we have here is our hydrogen. Our hydrogen hasn't moved. So there's our hydrogen there. And just like in the other one, um, we have our H plus, which is here. Um, and we have our lone pair of electrons, which set the oxygen. So there's a lone pair of electrons. Um, and let's just draw the curly arrow anyway. Okay, so the curly arrow will then go from here onto the H plus. I'll just add it on there as well, just to keep it all the same. Uh, and then effectively what you produce is this. H. There we go. Right. So very similar in terms of the mechanism. Okay. There's a few important points that we need to point out here. Cyanide is pretty toxic. Um, normally what we can use is something called potassium cyanide, which is a salt and much easier to handle than say like hydrogen cyanide. 
Um, but potassium cyanide is incredibly toxic, really, really nasty stuff. So when you take potassium cyanide, which is the salt, uh, and if you ingest that or breathe it in, um, that reacts with the water um, in your airways. And then that can actually form um, HCN, which is hydrogen cyanide, which is incredibly toxic, it's lethal. So you've really got to be careful with this stuff. And if you're using potassium cyanide or hydrogen cyanide in this example, um, then you must make sure that you're using the correct protective gear, fume cupboards, um, you make sure that you are um, covered in terms of gloves, protective gear, you don't want any of this stuff getting into contact with water, it isn't very nice, so really toxic. So you've got to be very, very careful that. That might ask about that in the exact, that's, that's pretty important. Um, another thing as well, like I can say, if you're using potassium cyanide, that will be dissolved in solution. That will provide you with your source of H plus ions as well. If you're using hydrogen cyanide, which you could do, again, obviously the hydrogen cyanide, um, if I just draw it there, HCN, there you go. Uh, this would break and you'd form H plus ions anyway, and CN minus ions. So this would be effectively where this has come from. So that's just accounting for all the ions that we've got in our solution. Uh, and then coming on to this product, you will be asked to name this molecule. Um, and the naming of it is a little bit different. Now you might look at that and think, well, I've got a nitrile group there, um, which of course you'd be right. Or you may be thinking, I've actually got a cyano group there because it's CN, cyanide. Um, and that bit, you'd be wrong. This bit is actually a nitrile group. When we have nitrogen bonded within an organic molecule like this, like a long chain carbon, we call them nitriles instead, not cyano. So this is not a cyano group. Another thing to work, look out for as well is look at the, 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 sorry, look at the length of the carbon chain. Now, if you look at the carbon chain here, you can see you've got one, two, three carbons to start off with. If we look at the start, we only have two. This is ethanol. So this one is now prop. So it's a propane molecule that we've got here with a nitrile uh, on the end of it. So, uh, and that's very, very important. And now here we have an OH. This is not an alcohol. This is called a hydroxy um, in this setup here. So normally if that N wasn't there, this would just be a secondary alcohol, but this is now called a hydroxy. So that's really, really important. Um, so those are little tricky bits there. So what's the name of this molecule? Well, the name is pretty straightforward. Um, all you have to do is this is called a hydroxy nitrile. Okay, so all we have to do is we have to look at the number of carbons. So we've got one, two, three carbons. So, um, and you can see here that we've got an OH here. The OH is sitting on the second carbon. So this is gonna be called 2-hydroxy. Uh, we've got one, two, three, propane with the E. Uh, and then we've got nitrile that's on the end. And there we have it. That's the name of the molecule. And um, that's quite important. Now, one little extra bit, I suppose, um, is this bit here, the carbon atom bit is flat. It's a flat molecule. Um, and that means um, you can get an um, attack basically from both sides. The cyanide can approach from the top of the molecule. So imagine there's our cyanide on the, on the hand there. So the, the nucleophile bit, effectively this bit here, can attack and it can attack from the top or it could attack from underneath. Now that's gonna give you different isomers um, and you could effectively get an equal amount. If this was in particular methanol, it was just one carbon, it's literally just flat, you could get an e even chance of your cyanide approaching from the top or your cyanide approaching from the bottom. Now what you get is something called a racemic mixture. Now this might seem a bit strange to you because you might not have done this yet, um, but a racemic mixture comes about when we have a chiral center. This is called optical isomerism. Now, if you don't know anything about optical isomerism, I suggest you look at the video um, that I've done under the uh, nomenclature and stereoisomerism playlist. Uh, and if you look on the video on stereoisomerism, you'll see what an optical isomer is. But just very, very quickly, just to kind of, if you have, just as a recap, show you where it links in. Um, we have an optical molecule here. We have a chiral center here. There it is, there's a carbon because we have four different groups surrounding the carbon atom in the middle. And so those four different groups are, you've got your cyanide group, you have a hydrogen, there's a different group. We also have our OH, which is there. And then the final bit is this bit. There's a methyl group, look, CH3. 
So you see this carbon in the middle has four completely different groups attached to it. And so that makes it optically, ice, uh, optically active. So that means it will rotate plain polarized light. Um, so that's pretty important. But if we get an equal um, share of what we call enantiomers, um, obviously the enantiomer is the type of isomer that we get. You get um, different types of enantiomers that rotate plain polarized light in different directions. So one turns it left, one turns it right. Again, more information on this video. I won't bear into it too much for this one. And um, then um, if you get um, an equal amount of each, we'd call what we call a racemic mix. And effectively, that has the effect of not rotating plain polarized light. Again, I don't want to go into it into this video. There's loads more information on this video on stereo stereoisomerism if you're not sure about that. But um, there we go. There's the video on nucleophilic addition reactions. I hope that helps. Uh, any questions, just add them to the comment box uh, just below. Thanks for now. Bye-bye.